Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're just gonna get started. Okay, I just wanna thank everybody for coming today uh, for our talk. Uh, this is uh, session eight, and it's part of our educational workshops here. Um, and uh, I also wanna give a special thanks to our donors uh, who may all make this possible. Um, and now I just want to introduce our, our guest speakers. Okay, uh, they are Dr. Warren Lewin, Dr. Haley Draper, and Dr. Nadine Gerbara. They are all part of the palliative care doctors here at the Toronto Western Hospital. And I just want to welcome them, welcome them here. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for having us here today. Um, so I'm Warren Lewin, one of the palliative care doctors and site lead um, of our program at Toronto Western. And this is Nadine uh, and Haley, and we're gonna introduce ourselves um, in a moment. But today's topic is living better. What is palliative care? And how does it help improve quality of life in dementia? And the objectives that we have are to address common myths about palliative care, and learn how it can help improve quality of life for loved ones, to describe the role of palliative care in advancing and advanced dementia, and to describe the program that we have here at UHN. So in an effort to make this a, a little bit more interactive, uh, we wanna get to know a little bit more about uh, everyone here in the audience. This includes the folks um, who are streaming from elsewhere. So we've included these electronic polls. So for those who have either computers or phones and feel comfortable doing so, um, a showing of hands for the folks in the room uh, is also an option. So what we would ask you to do is first to engage in the poll, is you can uh, text, it's my first name and last name, Nadine Jabara, 325 to that number. That'll register you for the poll or alternatively, um, there's the site just above it. Um, and so we would ask you the following question, which is... Sorry, for the people at home, can you just say what they have to text you? Oh, are the folks at home able to see this slide? Oh, perfect. Okay, so just at the top of the slide. So when you're ready, if you could respond to the following, I am here because um, either A, I'm a caring for a loved one with dementia, or B, I work in healthcare, C, is other. Yeah, so if you can text, sorry, so to the number 37607, the, the body of the text would be Nadine Jabara 325. That's a one time just to join, and that way you won't have to do it again with subsequent questions. So as the responses come in, it'll reflect on the, the graph here. Yeah, sorry if I wasn't clear. Once you've joined, then with each of the subsequent questions that we, um, that we ask, it'll be an, a lettered response. If anyone wants us to jump down and help, let us know. Okay, so it looks up. <laughs> okay. So clearly a, a, a large number in healthcare, uh, also caregivers, and I think that our talk today, initially we had in mind there would be many um, caregivers, but this presentation is important for all, particularly because healthcare providers are uh, certainly um, counseling, involved very closely with caregivers of individuals with dementia. 
Just for us to get a sense of the audience, for people who work in healthcare, um, can you maybe just shout out if you're in the hospital or in the community? I assume the hospital here. <laughs> Community. Yeah. John Rehab. Hospital. Hospital. Both. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so great. Uh, diverse group. So I think the first thing we'll share is if you haven't already picked up a copy of the book Being Mortal by Atul Gawande, we would highly recommend this book. Just by show of hands, has anyone read this book? Yeah, one, one person. Um, it is a phenomenal book. Um, it's written by Dr. Atul Gawande, who is a surgeon at um, the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And he's a revered surgeon. He came up with the surgical checklist to make things safer um, for people undergoing surgery. And a, Many years into his practice, his father uh, was diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer. And it was through that experience that he viewed healthcare for the first time through a different lens and perhaps a more humanistic lens. And from those experiences, he wrote this book. It is an easy read and really speaks to issues I think that resonate with, with everyone, um, living with anyone with an advanced serious illness. And paraphrasing from an interview, he wrote, I write to better understand things. The impetus for this book, I interviewed more than 200 families about their experiences with aging, frailty, and serious illness. I met and interviewed scores of palliative care clinicians, and what emerged were a group of people who did know what to do in these situations when faced with an unfixable problem. So as a surgeon, people would come to see him, there was a problem and he could fix it. With his father, with advanced cancer, that was stage four, it could not be cured. And what emerged was this completely different experience for him. When we can't fix things, what else can we do? And how do we help people live with best quality of life? And that's what this book is all about. And the two main things that he learned, he writes, is in medicine and society, we have failed to recognize that people have priorities to serve besides just living longer. And as medical trainees and probably all clinician trainees were taught how to fix things, and it's not really until palliative care training that you learn another way to help people. Um, and he also writes, the most reliable way to learn about people's priorities is to ask, and we don't ask. And I think that's something that our team is really working hard to advance um, with the training program that we have here is teaching clinicians how to ask difficult questions and using a framework, an evidence-based framework to do so. So just keep this in the back of um, your mind as we go through the talk. And if you haven't, uh, well, many people didn't read this book, I highly, highly, highly recommend this book. So why we do what we do. So, um, I will start, so again, I'm Warren Lewin, I'm one of the physicians here in Sight Lead for our program. Um, I trained as a family doctor, and in my fourth year of medical school, I was on my palliative care rotation, and I uh, got a call that my grandfather was in the hospital and was diagnosed with metastatic pancreatic cancer. Three weeks earlier, he was dancing at my cousin's wedding, and um, I knew by looking at him something was probably off. Um, and he was admitted to the hospital three weeks later with what everyone thought was a pneumonia. And so he was admitted under a lung specialist. And through scans, we learned that he had cancer. The doctor who cared for him was a lung doctor who had no training in palliative care and no training in how to break bad news or even how to manage very serious and scary symptoms like an agitation or a delirium. And so the entire hospital journey was quite scary for us as a family, and I can't imagine what it was like for him. Um, he was in Texas, and they did not have palliative care at all in that hospital, but they had wonderful hospice in the community. And so it was really through that experience and that in desperate dark times from that experience that I knew not only did I wanna become a palliative care doctor, but I also wanted to have a leadership position so that we can help advance this field so that everyone understands what it is that palliative care can do so that we can get people involved earlier so that no patient or family member has, um, lives in an area without access to this. Um, and I'm proud of the program that we're developing here, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the program we have here later. Before that, I'll introduce maybe Haley. Um, so Haley, why did you get into palliative care? 
So I'm Haley Draper, and I am a family physician with a focused practice in palliative care. Um, I share my time between here at Toronto Western and Kensington Hospice, which is just down the street. I sort of fell into palliative care. I didn't know very much about it in my medical training, mostly because it really isn't taught well in medical school. And even in my later years when I was in hospital, there was really very little exposure to palliative care. In my own family, I have only had two loved ones die and they were very polarizing experiences. So my grandfather died at home in Toronto, very quietly in his own bed with his wife. And my grandmother who died in Florida was in an intensive care unit, uh, very loud, noisy environment with really no palliative involvement at all. And me as a new palliative care doctor sort of directing her care. So it was really in residency where I was introduced to palliative care and I initially thought I would be that doctor in the emergency room which was sort of that like loud, noisy, exciting environment. But I found um, that there was something very special about palliative care, especially the little that I was exposed to in my training. I, I felt that I had a relationship with both patients and their families that was really meaningful. For the first time I felt like I could actually help people live better, live more comfortably, and then eventually die better. I think actually my patients like put it best why I keep doing this work. So I'm gonna read you a little excerpt from uh, a note that was written to our hospice. Uh, sorry. Um, and I think it was several years ago and it was just very poignant and, and brief and really explains uh, the work we do and why we do it. So dearest friends, in all the complications and uncertainty, your care and your support has meant the world to me and my family. You and your kindness will forever be part of the story of my mom's life. Thank you for giving her respect, care, dignity, and love. So to me, that really exemplifies the work that we all do in palliative care. And even when it's hard, which is almost every day, it reminds us why we are motivated to keep doing this, this hard job. a tough act to follow. Um, this may not answer the question of why I uh, decided to be a palliative care doctor, um, but you know, at almost every social gathering, as soon as someone asks, what do you do? And I say, I'm a palliative care doctor. Either there's a look of, I don't know what that is, or oh my gosh, that must be so sad and sort of halts the conversation. But over time, I've learned how to respond to that. And I say, Absolutely, it's certainly intense, but it, it is also so rewarding. Um, and a, um, an interaction that I had with a, a lovely female patient and her husband here at this hospital are a reminder of why I am so passionate about this work. Um, so years ago, I was involved in the care of a woman who had a very rare neurodegenerative disease. She walked into the hospital and emerged within two weeks. She was bed bound. She was sort of in and out of lucidity, times not making sense. Some features of dementia. Uh, and I watched as this woman changed quickly over time. Many teams involved, many physicians, nurses, and what have you. And I remember one day walking into her room and as I always do, addressing her, um, and her husband said, hey, do you remember this doctor? And she said, of course I do. She looks at me like I'm still alive. And it was just a great reminder of how we can get caught up in um, the age and diagnosis of someone and what their illness is and the pathology, but real, a real reminder about the human experience. This is someone um, who is having a terrible time. This is probably the worst time in their life, but we have the opportunity to support them in this um, and where possible, try to alleviate some of the suffering. So have you had experience with palliative care teams in the past? So if you want to text A for yes and B for no to that same thread. Sorry. Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> You're better than me when we um, 
when we go out, I actually don't tell people I do palliative care. I tell them I'm a master's in psychology student because it's a much better conversation. Okay, so it probably reflects that most people are um, healthcare care providers. Um, So most people have had exposure, um, which is great. I think the 30 percent dish that haven't had exposure um, reflects some of our experiences. I think the majority of folks that we meet, actually, especially with dementia, um, have not had exposure to palliative care. So some people are keen here. I apologize. I moved a little too quickly to the next slide. But um, responses to the following. I'm familiar with the term advanced care planning. So a for yes and B for no. So the majority of people, that's great. <laughs> so do you want to do the next one and then go back? Okay, one more question. Okay, so a lot of people know what the term is. A smaller number, but still the majority, are talking to their family and loved ones about it. And then the last question. So for those of you that are talking to your loved ones about this, um, have you spoken to your doctors or your clinicians, your healthcare team about it? And it may be because doctors aren't asking you. Yeah. So I think that's, um, for, especially for the people in healthcare and uh, for caregivers, probably your experiences is that many people will be thinking about these things. They may be talking to their loved ones about it. You may be thinking about it for yourself. Um, and then your caregiver, your clinicians are not asking you about what your priorities are and what your future um, would look like if you got ill. Um, so we're going to try to address some of this today and talk about how some of the palliative principles can address this. Okay, we're going to talk now a bit about dementia and palliative care. So um, unfortunately, palliative care has really played a small role in dementia, and that's for many reasons, but sort of the big reasons are is that often dementia is not being recognized as a terminal illness. So people often are seeing it as a chronic illness and therefore no need to really talk about what end of life will bring with this disease. There's a lot of prognostic uncertainty with dementia. So people have dementia for many years, sometimes upwards of 10 years, and it's hard to know when someone's gonna move from let's say moderate dementia to advanced dementia and then to the end stages of dementia. And the third is that there just really isn't a lot of research done in this area. So what is palliative care? So palliative care is a specialized medical care for people living with a serious illness. It focuses on providing relief from symptoms and stress of a serious illness. The goal of palliative care is to improve quality of life for both the patient and the family and or loved ones. It focuses on physical but also the emotional and social aspects of the illness experience. 
It can be, but not always, is provided by a specially trained team of doctors and nurses and other specialists who work together along with the patient's healthcare team as an extra layer of support. It's based on the needs of the patient. So it's not based only, it's not really based on patient's prognosis alone. Um, it really is appropriate at any age and at any stage of a serious illness. So really, um, it isn't just for those last days, weeks, or months of life with a serious illness. It's best through the entire trajectory of someone's disease. We know there are tons of benefits of palliative care. So um, it improves quality of life and also reduces the symptom, the burden of symptoms. And we know that uh, some studies have shown that 66% of symptoms are reduced and that those um, burdens or those improvements last often for many months after someone is initially seen by palliative care. There's also really high satisfaction in patients and families who receive palliative care. So 93% of people who receive palliative care are likely to recommend it to others. And just picking up on Haley's point, um, so that definition where we're an added layer of support to patients and families living with advanced serious illness is the language we'd encourage you to use if you're trying to get a loved one to see a palliative care specialist or if you're a healthcare professional um, and, and recommending this to uh, a client or a patient or family. People like, this is tested language and families and patients particularly like hearing the words added layer of support. This article we put up here, um, just to share that um, the public really is demanding a better care model for, for people with advanced illness who are aging. So this is almost a decade old now, and it was written and was highlighted in the New York Times. Um, it was written by a caregiver, a woman, um, and she wrote, fighting to honor a father's last wish to die at home. And it was about her struggle dealing with, this was in New York, the system that was so broken that she couldn't get what she needed for her loved one. And what I found most interesting was the number of comments that it generated. So you can see up there, it's over a thousand comments and that was within a few days. So this is really resonating with other people that when you need an acute care facility, um, it's there for you, people know how to fix things, but when you have something more chronic that needs, um, and your needs are, are more than what an acute care facility can get you, or even what a, a long-term care facility can get you, um, it means that we need to change the system, and the, the public is really demanding this, and I think gonna be a driver of change. One of the comments um, said, while it can seem like a miracle of modern medicine that fewer people pass away of sudden heart attacks or acute illness, we are facing the perverse and tragic alternative. We slowly and painfully get sicker and sicker, pump our bodies with more medications, spend increasing amounts of time in hospitals and nursing homes, and ultimately die with little dignity and perhaps a lot of regret. Um, and I think this was a comment that was echoed throughout all these 1,000 comments that we were reading. Um, and so I think the bottom line is that people want an alternative and we think palliative care is a way of, of helping uh, these people and to drive systems change. And the way palliative care can help specifically with dementia is to act as an added layer of support, um, to help with decision making early on in one's illness, and um, to address symptoms that other people may be attempting to manage or not managing. And so we'll go next to some of the common myths um, about what palliative care is not and what it is. So one of our hopes in time is that the, the culture in medicine um, and the comfort level with using the words palliative care will increase. And we think that some of these myths are contributing to that fear or um, perhaps the aversion to the term palliative care for some people. So there's a myth that dementia is not a terminal illness. A myth that palliative care is only for people who are close to the end of life or those with cancer. A myth about opioid medications hastening or death or speeding up death. The myth that palliative care only happens in hospitals. The myth that not eating will cause a person to starve to death. And lastly, and this is not an, um, an exhaustive list, of course, but that tube feeding will help a person live longer with dementia. So myth number one, dementia is not a terminal illness. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Dementia is, in fact, a terminal illness. It is essentially brain failure, 
we hear a lot about heart failure, end-stage lung disease, kidney failure. Well, dementia affects the brain, and it is progressive, meaning worsening over time, and unfortunately, there is no cure. The brain is the central control station for the heart, the lungs, your digestive tract, essentially the functioning of the body. So unfortunately, there are many complications which can include infections, whether they be in the skin, ulcers, skin breakdown, uh, respiratory tract infections, urinary tract infections. Another uh, common complication or problem associated is with eating, whether that be being able to feed oneself, being able to coordinate the swallowing safely. So this graph here is intended to show over time. So uh, from left to right across the, the x-axis is um, time. And then from bottom to top or top to bottom is someone's function. So presumably most of us here in the room are somewhere close to 100, functioning day to day. At the time of diagnosis of dementia already, there is some impairment in someone's function, their day-to-day -day activities. And over time, there is quite some unpredictability. So it's not every individual will follow a certain graph or a certain line. Not every single individual falls into a, a statistic and follows. However, what we do know is over time, there is worsening of the disease. And there are bumps along the way. Perhaps someone has an infection. They take a dip down, perhaps they recover from that infection, but they don't quite go back to the way they were before the infection. The red arrow there is to give an indication about when palliative care is typically first introduced. It's quite along the way in time and quite close to end of life. So part of our hope is not that every individual needs a palliative care physician, but that conversations around a palliative care approach could start earlier than at that red arrow. Can I make a comment? Of course. Just a, com just a question, actually. How many of the um, clinicians in the room draw out a prognostic curve for their patients? One. Yeah. So what changed my practice, I was at a conference a few years ago, and I was attending a heart failure talk, which has um, a different prognostic curve, but lots of ups and downs. And um, this was at the Mayo Clinic, and they recommended drawing this out for your patients and their families to understand big picture what the illness will look like. And I started doing that with every one of my patients and fam most of my patients and families. And I will say that it's an aha moment for so many people and allows them to see the kind of what to expect. I actually circle the bottom right hand corner, which is death, and say that is not what I'm here to talk about. That is not why I've been asked to see your loved one. It's to really help with everything before that and that. And it allows um, people to understand that palliative care can actually be involved across the trajectory of one's illness. And also, for the visual learners, allows them to see that this is, in fact, a terminal illness and that, that death is not escapable and um, that we need to start thinking about um, plans throughout some, someone's illness. So I, I challenge people in the room or at home to draw this out um, and draw um, any prognostic curve out for uh, different uh, trajectories for chronic illness, for relapsing illness like heart failure and lung disease, and also for cancer um, as a way to talk about planning. And happy to chat um, afterwards about what that looks like in the three different graphs that we use. So in terms of defining dementia in very uh, simple terms, dementia is an umbrella term, and there are subtypes, but ultimately um, there are um, dysfunctions of the brain, memory problems, changes in the way someone uh, thinks and in the way they behave and interact with uh, the people around them. And as we've discussed and seen on the graph, unfortunately, over time, it does get worse. And when we say advanced dementia, we're talking about the late stages. So if we um, break things down into pretty basic categories about early, so early stage dementia might look like someone having trouble managing their finances all of a sudden. Forgetting recent events or names, but perhaps um, long-term memory is preserved. A difficulty remembering to take medicines. Difficulty recognizing acquaintances or people they may not know very well. The middle stage uh, dementia is increasing need for help with com more complex chores or hobbies, perhaps getting lost in a place that should be familiar, 
irritability or agitation because we know that that does affect what might seem like someone's personality and their, their interpersonal interactions. And difficulty recognizing family members. In the late stages of dementia, what we often see are difficulties with eating. So these eating problems, which may be um, a difficulty with swallowing, coughing, which is a sign of a problem with swallowing, inability to do their day-to-day -day routine uh, activity, activities of daily living. So bathing, dressing, needing assistance in the washroom, reduced minimal I'm sorry, reduced verbal communication. So we may be talking about very little interactions, maybe a few words, possibly more, but very little uh, verbal communication. And what is also possible are recurrent infections. So this last stage, the advanced dementia, for many people is in, the, in three to six years after diagnosis. And as we talked about speech, memory, function of the body, level of independence and caring for oneself, and walking also becomes impaired. Someone spending more time in a wheelchair, more time in bed. And we've spoken about some of the, the complications, which are typically what precipitate that last uh, phase and the transition to uh, dying. So it might have been um, an eating problem, for example, developing a, a pneumonia because we're not able to coordinate the swallowing safely, and perhaps saliva or food or water can go into the respiratory tract rather than to, into the digestive tract. The end of life can be quite unpredictable from a time frame, and I will say that, and I, I imagine my colleagues would agree that um, estimating someone's life expectancy can be difficult no matter the disease, but with dementia particularly, it can be quite unpredictable. What most people worry about, what we hear from family members, whether it be a cancer, dementia, is people are worried that their loved one is going to suffer at the end of life. What we have often seen is that there isn't necessarily suffering with um, discomfort, physical discomfort, at the end of life with dementia. There don't tend to be big surprises, suddenly a development of a new problem, you know, hours before the end of life. There are common symptoms that can happen at the end of life for almost anyone who is nearing the end of life for various uh, diseases. Fatigue and sleep are the most common, no matter the disease, but particularly with dementia, more time spent sleeping, more signs of fatigue and weakness. There may be some mild changes to the breathing, and that might be also if they've developed um, an aspiration pneumonia. These are things that can be managed from a comfort perspective. There may be some restlessness or agitation, more confusion. There may be saliva pooling in someone's mouth because their swallowing hasn't been impaired. We've all had the experience of falling asleep on a bus or in a chair, and we all start drooling. And most of us, when we wake up and realize, we either wipe it away, we swallow, <clears throat> or we clear our throat. And in, in the late stages of dementia, those functions are impaired. So there can be collection of saliva in the mouth. Um, pain is not necessarily something that happens to everyone near the end of life. And it's not necessarily common with dementia. Okay. Thanks, Nadine. Um, and just to go back to the earlier slide, um, Nadine said it, um, palliative care, the referral to palliative care should not be prognosis based. We shouldn't think of when to initiate palliative care based on where someone's at in their trajectory. Anyone with a life limiting illness um, should have palliative care. And we will define this later on. There's specialist versus generalist palliative care. So that doesn't mean you need to refer to a specialist palliative care team early on. Um, but many, every clinician should be able to have a core skill set that addresses many pa uh, unmet palliative care needs. And so one way to kind of remind ourselves, um, whether we're looking after someone with dementia or we're caring for someone with dementia as a clinician, about should I be um, invoking palliative care principles at this point, is looking at the stages of dementia and seeing did they shift from the earlier to the middle stage. That should be a signifier for our conversation. When they go from middle to late, that should be a signifier for our conversation as well.
and a general check-in of um, you know, unmet symptoms. And the other thing I'll just add, because um, it's a different talk in and of itself, is symptom management at end of life, and Nadine touched upon this, but because folks with dementia cannot speak for themselves in their final stage, stage of life, and a lot of them get agitated or restless, the number one thing that we assume this to be would be pain. So we would start someone on standing Tylenol and see if those behaviors got better. And I think we often see this, um, at least on the inpatient setting, is that when we come in, it's always many times unmet pain needs that can be addressed and then behaviors calm down. Just wanted to add that. The second myth is palliative care is only for people who are close to end of life or those with cancer. And we've touched upon this. The palliative care, again, is about quality of life and not death. And Dr. Balfour Mount, who is one of the founding fathers of palliative care, wrote, what has surprised me is how little palliative care has to do with death. The death part is almost irrelevant. Our focus is not on dying, our focus is on quality of life. And I think for people who practice palliative care, we really subscribe to this. And it's amazing the conversations you can have with people because they're all about the here and now and what we can do. And the death piece is um, a very small component uh, and a conversation that can happen once about what someone's end of life will look like and how we want to manage them at end of life. And the rest is all about living and doing what we can to help people live. And we've said this again, palliative care can be involved from day one of diagnosis of an advanced serious illness. And that's depicted on the graph here. Again, on the bottom going left to right is um, time. So early diagnosis to end of life on the right and bereavement. And then the titration of disease directed therapies and palliative care and how they overlap. And you can see that there's ups and downs. So it may be that, um, you know, the, the the neurological team is managing the dementia um, or the cancer doctor is managing the cancer and then we get called in um, for a specialist need and then we back off because the main team can continue providing the care but then something else happens uh, down the road and then we work together in partnership and it's all about titrating when we get involved and when we, we don't need to be involved and just because you've gotten us involved doesn't mean that we need to stay involved. Why we think this model works, um, there was a landmark study now almost 10 years ago um, out of uh, Mass General Hospital that looked at the early benefits of palliative care. And this is for a cancer population and we're starting to see an emerging research database showing that these benefits extend into non-cancer diagnoses like dementia. So this study essentially uh, divided patients with incurable lung cancer into two groups. One group received standard cancer care they saw the nurse, the doctor, the dietitian, the entire complementary team at a cancer center. And the other group saw that exact same team and received concurrent palliative care. And the team that received both palliative care and routine um, cancer care reported an increase in their quality of life, lower levels of depression, less aggressive care, meaning less chemotherapy in their bodies uh, in the last month of life. And they actually, and what surprised our community is that patients actually lived longer having palliative care involved by a couple of months. And so this really was um, a hurrah moment for palliative care because we had a study now that could show that having us involved um, had many benefits for patients and families. And I think one of the reasons people not want, that people tend not to want to bring up palliative care or have their loved one get referred to a palliative care specialist or talk about these um, difficult things um, is that people will lose hope, become depressed and die sooner. And we actually have data and it's backed up by over six studies now to show the same thing, that people's hope does not get taken away, that they have lower levels of depression and that they may actually live longer. And so um, this is why we say, or why this model has some data behind it to say palliative care should be involved, at least its principles, from day one of an advanced serious illness diagnosis. Okay, so we're gonna go through the next uh, few myths. So myth number three is that opioid medications hasten death. And this is a myth that we hear every single day from not only patients and their families, but also clinicians. The fact is, is that opioids are really our best treatment for treating both pain and shortness of breath, um, especially when other options have been exhausted. 
Opioid medicines include medicines like morphine, hydromorphone, oxycodone, fentanyl, which gets lots of bad press these days. Um, and if these medicines are given appropriately, there are really no side effects outside of constipation. People often worry about the sedating, so that, the, that these medicines make people sleepy, that they make people confused, that they drive hallucinations, that they stop people from breathing or hasten death. Um, and they do none of those when they're prescribed properly. They often actually help people um, you know, be able to get on with their day and enjoy their life because they're less burdened by uh, symptoms like pain and breathlessness. Can I just ask a question? Of course. Did you say, but if given properly, like, how do we know it's done properly? Right? Like, you know, it, it would be nice to always have a specialist like you when you're all at once or at the last stage, but if there isn't any, then that might be the discomfort that I would have. And given opiates, yeah, and, and I mean that's part of our um, our goal in trying to educate. Hmm? Did, did everyone hear that question? For the stream. for the, uh, for the stream. Sorry. Uh, so the question was, um, uh, that's great that uh, if they're you know they're given appropriately by a palliative care doctor, but what if um, you don't have access to palliative care and they're given by someone who you may not feel as confident? Um, it's a good question. Uh, opioids. I think in our experience are mostly given quite appropriately and sometimes they need sort of a, a couple of days to go up and down to find that exact dose. Uh, they are, they are um, never really given to the point of, um, of causing someone to stop breathing or end up in an intensive care unit, which is the number one worry that we hear. Uh, and part of this is, is our job in trying to educate people about how to properly prescribe these medicines and the importance of um, primary palliative care, which is sort of educating uh, primary care doctors and people's other doctors to be able to do sort of, ba to be able to manage basic needs like pain um, uh, throughout the illness trajectory as well as end of life. And also, one way that you will know if they're being used effectively is if your loved one gets better. Um, if they stop moaning, if they're not restless anymore. If you see that a medicine was given and then they slept for two days, the dose was too high. If they start hallucinating, that might not be the right agent for that person. Um, and that's when I would say, hey, can we speak to the doctor um, mm -hmm. or the nurse because this doesn't look right. The goal was to stop the moaning, but now he's sleeping all day. And it may be that the dose then needs to come down. So it's really the effect. Having said that, whenever an opioid is started for the first time, we do expect to see a little, some people just sleep for a little bit, um, or they're tired for a few days, and that's because they've been living with pain for so long, and it's exhausting. Um, people who have been working to breathe for, for a long period of time, and they're huffing and puffing like this, finally you give them the opioids they need to calm their breathing down, and they might sleep for a few days, but then they should get up and they should start acting like And Warren doesn't mean sleep for a few days, but just that their Rest. level of sleepiness may go up a little bit over those few days. Yeah. So the common things are that someone might get nauseous with the first couple doses, so we usually prescribe an anti-emetic um, if that happens. Um, and people can get into urinary retention, which I rarely see, I think we rarely see that, but if your loved one gets started on an opioid and then they haven't urinated, um, it could be related to the opioid and they might need a Foley for a day or two or changing of the dose, but um, these are why we, we need to train people and have skilled conversations so people know what to expect. But the scary side effects, which is what most people worry about, which is my loved one's gonna be a zombie um, or end up in the ICU, they're gonna stop breathing, like Haley mentioned. We have not seen that. I don't think any of us have ever had to use special medicines to reverse giving too much opioid because we know how to use it. And I would say in our experience, most doctors, at least in the hospital, under-prescribe or don't even ask about pain and they're not even giving um, the medicines and they know to start low and go slow. Yeah, there's a Okay, in the long-term care community, which is where I work, um, from outreach from the hospital, family doctors are least comfortable in prescribing this 
type of medication and more comfortable when they see the agitation at the end of someone's life in prescribing antipsychotics. And it's, it's very distressing because I get a lot of referrals for what is end stage agitation and restlessness and also lack of appetite or decreased weight, loss of appetite. And the family doctors are asking us to prescribe antidepressants to stimulate their appetite, but they're dying, or antipsychotics so they're not so loud and kind of um, agitating for the co-residents. And I'm a mental health clinician, I work with a psychiatrist, and most often we come in and we say, assess their pain, you know, I look at their MAR and they're on PRN 325 milligrams of Tylenol twice a day or three times a day. So, I, I mean, it's really, they're so scared of even using regular Tylenol at the highest dose and hardly anybody is getting this type of medication in long-term care. And it's really, how do we educate those family doctors um, that it's not psychiatric at this point? We actually had a similar conversation this morning when we were meeting um, with our hospice and the nursing home that, that is right beside our hospice. Okay, that's yours. Um, and uh, that's something that they, they actually brought up. And again, a reason why we need to, you know, maybe take this show on the road to different long-term care facilities and do better education for primary care practitioners. And that's really sort of one of the goals of our site is not to necessarily train clinicians like ourselves who do tertiary palliative care, but to train primary palliative care providers who are gonna go and be family doctors and be able to provide good palliative care or be a long-term care physician and do a good job managing symptoms at end of life. Yeah. So. Something that's coming down the pipeline and I think happening in the next couple of months is the province is setting up kind of e-consults where a family physician and I think a nurse practitioner also can email into a centralized site and various specialists from palliative care specialty will be responding to people's questions and needs. You know, what is the starting dose of an opioid? I'm seeing this, what should I do? Um, and so I, I, I know that that is coming down the pipeline. So something that you can ask leadership to tap into and make sure you're set up because you'll probably need to log in and whatnot. But this is a huge need uh, in long-term care in the community. A second question, yeah. thing again. There's a lot of prescribing of nabilone, which is a synthetic. Everybody knows what that is, I think, for CBD. Um, and a lot of my terminally ill dying patients are now getting nabilone and CBD oil in capsules because there's all these, I guess, companies that are coming into the long-term care homes and, and talking about the benefits. And I don't think they're all proven yet, but um, this seems to be happening more often now than an opioid prescribed. It's sort of interesting that there's much more comfort level with CBD and nabilone than there is with these doses, but I think that also has to do with um, what we hear in the media, of course, right? If you heard the word, if you were a family member and your doctor approached you and said, we want to give him fentanyl, you might panic. Um, but actually, fentanyl is an excellent opioid when used appropriately, and it's actually quite safe when used properly. So it's part of um, what we're exposed to in our comfort levels. I would say as a general practice uh, in our group, we don't tend to prescribe nabilone that often or uh, CBD. Will that change over time? Maybe. But I think what we're all hearing and sharing is um, that everyone is wanting a common goal here. And I think just to add on, it goes back to the myth, the one that we already discussed. When people hear morphine, they often think of morphine equals dying. Um, you know, I use morphine for my heart failure population to get them to do physical therapy. They get breathless and they stop doing physical therapy, but we give them a small dose of an opioid and all of a sudden they can do their physical therapy again and they get stronger. So I think it's gonna take time for that education to get out there. Um, but it's that myth of opioids it means someone's dying and um, CBD maybe reminds people of their youth and they're more comfortable. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so to move on to myth four, so palliative care only happens in hospitals, and we're going to talk a bit about what palliative care looks like at our site, but really palliative care occurs in every setting. So it occurs in the home, it does occur in hospitals, it happens in outpatient clinics, it can happen in rehab facilities where clinicians go in and provide consultation. 
It happens in long-term care, perhaps not enough, but it does. Um, and then there are specialized units called hospices and palliative care units that are often staffed by physicians like us uh, that provide more comp uh, um, palliative care to people with more complex needs. Myth number five, so this is, so not eating will cause a person to starve to death. This is probably second to opioids uh, hastening death, one of the most common uh, uh, questions that we field in our, in our work. The fact is eating uh, it, less is expected with advanced dementia and all, most other illnesses, cancers, heart disease, kidney disease, it's a natural part of most illnesses. And hunger and thirst often get smaller as end of life approaches. And you can often reflect if you've had loved ones who have gone through this process that their interest in eating and drinking often diminishes months before end of life approaches. Um, even their favorite foods they're no longer interested in. The big message that we share with all of our patients and families is not eating and not drinking will not cause harm to your body. And that's the biggest fear that people have, is that they're causing harm to their body by not eating and drinking. We talk to people, especially with advanced dementia, uh, about a concept called careful hand feeding. So this is feeding either by hand or by spoon um, with the goal of providing food in a way that's comfortable to the person. So we think about what kind of food we're giving, something that's pleasurable to someone, the texture of food that's safest for someone to eat, and the amount of food that someone can tolerate without feeling unwell. Um, we focus less on the number of calories, so often careful hand feeding isn't necessarily using nutrition supplements like Boost or Ensure, but uh, perhaps it's ice cream and bacon, which seems to be the most popular foods in our hospice at end of life. Um, and it really allows a person to enjoy the taste of food, something that can't happen when someone is being tube fed or artificially fed. And it also encourages interactions with people's loved ones and caregivers as they feed them. This goes along with it. So tube feeding will help a person live longer with dementia. From what we know, artificial feeding or feeding by tube does not extend survival. So people do not live longer. It also does not prevent aspiration. So that's food going the wrong way, so into the lungs instead of into the stomach. It does not lead to people gaining weight. People often think that if they're being fed directly into the stomach that they're gonna become more robust and strong and gain weight, but weight loss continues even when people are tube fed. It's really risky, so it causes pain it can cause infection, it can cause bleeding, it often worsens people's state of confusion, it makes people restless, they end up in and out of hospitals because the tube gets blocked because they pull it out. We sometimes see people restrained to their bed or with big mitts on them to prevent them from pulling the tube out. We also know that leading organizations recommend against tube feeding. So there's a handout that um, you may have, um, and this is a similar handout by the Coalition for Compassionate Care of California. And really, it's just showing that wherever your loved one is being cared for, there usually is um, a decision aid to help people navigate the decision of whether someone should be uh, tube fed or whether there's a more appropriate way of feeding someone. So. Yeah, of course. How do you uh, help families that talk about hydration? So they can sort of understand, yeah, I'm not eating by yourself, not feeding them, yes, but then they're going to get dehydrated, their kidney is going to be shot, and we're going to hasten death. So how do you go? Sure. So. I think the question, whenever someone asks me a question, I ask them one back. So uh, like I was taught to be very curious. So my curiosity would, would make me ask them, what are you hoping the fluids will do? And uh, that's how we can dispel the myths and help them understand what's happening. So if someone is hoping that um, fluids are going to help them stay hydrated, give them more energy, we can tell them that unfortunately 
that's not going to happen with fluids. And what we can do instead is use Vaseline on people's lips. We can tell them that there's a study where they looked head to head at giving fluids versus um, using proper mouth care uh, with the artificial saliva, um, uh, proper mouth care, that people actually said that their thirst was quenched better not using fluids. Unfortunately, what happens as the body begins to slowly shut down is that fluid goes to places that we don't want it to go, like the lungs causing breathlessness, the belly, the legs causing discomfort. That's why we're concerned about using it. Um, so I would always ask a loved one, you know, help me understand what you'd like this to do. Now, it and can- And in addition to yeah. that, not just what you're hoping for, but what you what are you worried about? Yes. So that may also help dispel some myths. Yeah, exactly. Now, we have some people who um, a little bit of opioid um, fluid actually can help them if they had an acute incident, they had an infection, um, and they need a little bit of fluids to help them if they're not uh, dying. Um, so it's always an in-the-moment decision, but fluids generally, at the end of life, when people's bodies are shutting down, it's not indicated because of those reasons. But that's how we usually would bring it up, and we usually would recommend doing this not when you're faced with this, but at an annual checkup or whatnot, or when you go see your, your patient next and say, you know, I wanted to put on the agenda a few things that I think we're going to need to talk about, um, and one of them is feeding and one of them is fluids. And I'd like to talk to you about what, you know, the future of you know your your loved one's life is going to look like so we can make decisions now does that help yeah um so that actually goes into the next session so if we don't have these conversations and i think everyone many people would probably say this it's come up here and it's come up here and it's definitely what we live every day um when people don't have these anticipatory discussions people end up in the hospital um and people often get treated quite aggressively aggressively uh, rather than with a palliative intent to care. And the goal is not to shift every single person to adopt a palliative philosophy of care. The goal is to find out what the patient and family wants and get them the care that they need. So when we get asked to see patients, we never go in with the mindset of, we know exactly what we're gonna be recommending. We go and we listen and we hear what they want. And sometimes the recommendation will be, well, this patient needs to go to the ICU for IV fluids and for pressors to help their blood pressure uh, be sustainable and to treat this infection. And for other people, they kind of say, why hasn't anyone spoken to me about this? I would never want this. My loved one wouldn't want this and we can help direct them there. So without those conversations, people end up in the hospital multiple times usually. Uh, many people with dementia in their last three months of their lives are sent to the hospital for IV treatment and for consideration of feeding tubes. And we've heard that they don't do what we want them to do uh, in this population. And these treatments can actually cause distress and pain with little or no quality of life benefit and no prolongation of life. Um, and when families and caregivers do understand the nature of advanced dementia, they're less likely, not always, but less likely to want to intervene aggressively. And then um, this relates back to palliative care's involvement. And it, we know that when palliative principles of care, whether a specialist or a non-specialist is involved, talking about these things and, and implementing a, a care plan with these principles, people come to the hospital less, they have better symptom control in their home, uh, caregivers feel more prepared uh, and experience less caregiver burnout, and people end up more so than not dying in their setting of, uh, of choice. And the big question is why? And why does palliative care have these outcomes? It's because we match treatment to patients' priorities. And that comes back to asking your patients and families what they're wanting. Given that we can't reverse things, what would be important to your partner at this time? What would be important to you if down the road this were to happen. And so we always ask, what are your priorities of care? Um, and a study, um, again, almost a decade old now, looking at elderly individuals um, in the final phase of their life, not with dementia, people who were cognitively intact and could, could talk about their priorities, ranked independence as the most important priority at end of life, followed by pain and symptom relief. They ranked staying alive last among those three. Yet our healthcare system is built that the default is to help people stay alive without looking at pain and symptom relief and without helping them achieve independence. So it's gonna take a while for our healthcare system to catch up with what the priorities of the people that we're caring for want. And one way to do this is to invoke palli or involve palliative care earlier and to in have discussions with uh, about end of life care. Skip, skip, skip. skip.
I'll skip. Just, um, maybe what we'll do is we'll just go back to, we did the questions earlier, or the poll earlier about advanced care planning. And the majority had heard this term, advanced care planning. The majority have spoken to their loved ones. However, the majority have not spoken with their health care providers about this, which is important. Sorry, there we are. So advanced care planning um, is the process of considering, discussing, and planning for your future health care in the event that you're not able to make your own decisions and consent to treatment or, or lack of. So this is um, not to be confused with talking about, you know, it's not quite the same as, you know, looking at a list of things and deciding I want this, I don't want that. It's not quite that. It's broader. It's talking about what's important to you we can anticipate exactly what scenarios we might find ourselves in, but to talk about what is important to us and what that will help guide the decisions. So there, um, most ideally, we talk about this well in advance of any problem uh, arising. Ideal, not always the case. Uh, but the two key components here are number one, to talk about your wishes and your values, your belief systems, and what you might hope, hope that your end of life care looks like. Secondly, is to determine who is going to be your voice if you're no longer able um, to speak for yourself. So that's when we talk about a, a proxy or a substitute decision maker. So 80% of Canadians say they are comfortable talking about their end of life care and related issues. This is important because sometimes we're afraid to talk to our loved ones. We don't want the doctor, don't tell mom she's going to lose hope. I don't want to talk about that. She's going to be depressed. And yet, actually, we might be from a place of love, trying to protect each other. But it is important to talk about. And actually, it looks like most people are comfortable talking about this. 86% 80 of people, of Canadians, I'm, I'm sorry, say they have not heard of advanced care planning. Maybe not this term, but um, most people have thought of um, or have been able to talk about what they do or don't want. The term is less important. We, we refer to advanced care planning um, as this process, but 50% have had a discussion with a family member or friend about their end of life care wishes. So even if you haven't used the terms advanced care planning, maybe you've spoken about uh, what you hope for, uh, maybe based on having witnessed an experience of another loved one or a family member. 9% of Canadians have spoken to healthcare providers, so that's a small number. Um, there is an excellent resource online, Speak Up. Um, so I would encourage each of you um, to have a look at this website. So we're going to be watching a video in a moment that was actually pulled from this website. Um, there are also some tips whether you're hoping to speak to a loved one or as a healthcare provider wanting to initiate a conversation, they actually even have tools on how you might start this conversation. Maybe I'm really, you know, in the household you grew up in, this is not something you spoke about, but there's sort of um, strategies of um, blaming someone else. You know what, I was just at the doctor and the doctor told me I should talk about this, or maybe it's um, relating to something in the news. Like, there are strategies for almost every possible scenario. We'll do here. Just before you go to the video, yeah. just to share also that the Speak Up campaign is a national campaign, um, and they have uh, educational materials specific um, province by province. Um, and so the one that we have here is for Ontario, and like Nadine said, is widely available, and your institutions can organize um, to purchase it. And in many languages. In many languages, there are resources that can be printed from the website. Additionally, there is Advanced Care Planning Day. It was in April of this year. Surely it's going to come up again. And so there are actually kits uh, that organizations can pull from off the website to promote advanced care planning at your own, in your own workplace. And I think a gentle way to get the ball rolling is to tell people, if you're a clinician, I want to make sure that I'm giving you the best care possible, and that looks different for everybody. Um, that's a nice way to start the conversation. If you're a caregiver um, or yourself a patient, you can say to your, your nurse or your doctor, I want to make sure that I'm always getting the best care possible and I want to talk to you about this. Um, and we find that when we start with that, people, um, it's a nice gentle way to open the conversation. Okay. So 
here is our video. I would guess there's a big percentage of people don't like to talk about it. And there's a big percentage of people that it happens suddenly, you never get a chance to talk about it. Well, of course, we are from the age that things weren't talked about. It's not part of, hey, what'd you have for supper last night? You, you've got to know what to do, what you want done. We have to talk about this. We should talk about it so that when and if this happens, you get the care that you want. The same day I came in, they told me I had leukemia. You can't see uh, the leukemia going away. My wife and I have talked about uh, pretty well everything. Well, we did talk when you were in the hospital. Oh yeah, I guess and you so. did make the, the decision. We've talked since then and before that a little bit. What did I decide? You decided that you didn't want any CPR and that you didn't want resuscitation. Well, I still think that. <laughs> It's very difficult for a family member to make that decision if there's been no discussion. Most of the time we wait too late. We're often in a critical situation when we're asking those questions. So it is new to us to talk openly about private things. I think it takes a while to get comfortable because it is a privacy thing, eh? even with your own family. It's not so simple to say what you want or what you don't want. We're in a situation where we're having to communicate with family members about decisions to either apply or continue or withdraw life-sustaining treatments. Frequently you hear, oh, you know, I don't know what mom would have wanted. Mom never told me or mom never talked to me about this. And so the family then in that acute moment has to struggle with helping us make decisions with what mom would have wanted. It would have been so much easier had mom communicated to their, her family in advance what her wishes, what her preferences, what her values would have been. Well, this is just, there are many other such video clips on that website. Um, I would encourage, I mean, this could be for your loved one, your health care provider, your healthy family members. Um, so a great resource, um, whether for your workplace or for your personal life. In terms of advanced care planning, so an important piece that, so that first part was talking about your values, your beliefs, and your hopes for your end of life. Uh, the second piece is who will be your voice if you're unfortunately not able to speak for yourself, whether that be from uh, being impaired cognitively or just not being able to speak at that time. There is a hierarchy if you haven't already appointed someone to be your decision maker. So there may be legally appointed, uh, whether it was appointed uh, by the court or a power of attorney for personal care if you've legally appointed uh, someone or a representative appointed by the consent and capacity board. Those are sort of less common scenarios, so we won't um, touch on that too much uh, right now. But then the default starts. So if someone has not been legally appointed, there is a hierarchy, starting with a spouse or partner. Next, being a child or parent. This will obviously vary uh, depending on how old you're, the person um, who is ill is, a parent who only has right of access, a sibling, and then any other family member. In a situation where someone may not have a next of kin, it would then go to a public guardian uh, and trustee. So we would ask these questions. Are you happy with who your automatic substitute decision would be, substitute decision maker would be? And if not, encouraging to appoint someone. If you are happy with the hierarchy, would you be happy with multiple people equally sharing in that decision-making process? We've, in our clinical experience, been exposed to situations where, let's say, um, there's someone, let's use an example of someone with dementia or someone with a critical illness who's not speaking for themselves, and they have six children. These six children can't agree to what to movie to watch or what to have for dinner, and yet we're asking them to collectively agree on a decision about something that is so important. Um, so it is important to think about if you're not already happy with who it would fall onto by default, um, it would be really important to appoint someone. Absolutely. I think just it's important to add that it, um, uh, if there are multiple siblings, they all automatically 
have to agree to make the decision. I just want to make sure that that was clear. It doesn't, so if you don't want every single one of your children to have to agree, you have to complete a power of attorney for personal care and name the person that you want or the people that you want to be able to make those decisions. So speaking of which, um, we were posting this not because anyone needs to memorize this, but just to show that it's actually not complicated. You don't need a lawyer to do this. It's quite simple. So assigning a power of attorney requires that you in the moment are competent to assign someone, but it, it's not overly onerous. Okay, uh, just to move along with advanced care planning, we're gonna talk a bit more about decision making. Um, studies have shown that patients with advanced dementia who had advanced directives had better palliative outcomes. And by better palliative outcomes, that means that they are having less tube feeding, fewer admissions to hospital, and greater access to palliative care and palliative care resources. The next few slides, um, and then we're gonna follow up uh, with an actual case where we take you through some decision making, um, are gonna focus uh, mostly on sort of establishing goals of care. Um, there are sort of three main steps to decision making. So the first step in making a decision is to understand the clinical scenario. So like what is happening with uh, your loved one? What is happening with your own health? Um, you know, in the case of dementia, how advanced is your dementia? Are there complications of your dementia? What kind of treatments are they offering um, for your underlying illness or those complications? The next step is establishing goals of care. And we're gonna talk a bit more about sort of the different, sort of three different categories of goals of care. But when you're trying to establish goals of care, there are some sort of helpful things to think about. So one is, is there already an advanced care planning document that helps guide you? If there isn't an advanced care planning document, what do you know about your loved one's value? So what's important to them? What have they shared is important for them each day to have a day that, um, to have a good day, or what's considered good quality of life? What kinds of functions could they, no long, could they not live without? So someone may say, I can't live, I wouldn't want to live longer if I couldn't interact with my family, or if I couldn't enjoy eating, or if I couldn't sit in my garden and enjoy the flowers in the spring. The third thing you, uh, you may want to think about is, were there any previously expressed wishes? So when, you know, my partner saw their father pass away, did they express that they'd never want to live like that if they were in an ICU setting? Um, so have they shared any thoughts about how they would like their care to be if they were faced with um, a, a, a serious illness or a complication? And then the third part is trying to align the treatment with those goals of care. So determining goals of care, we've sort of divided it into sort of three easy to understand categories. So comfort as a goal, living longer as a goal, and something in between as a goal. And we're gonna talk about each of them in turn. So comfort as a goal, this is, um, this is what we do best, but it is really on focusing on keeping a person comfortable, um, for as long as possible. It may mean changing medicines or increasing medicines or increasing supports that provide comfort or promote comfort. It's often, in, if comfort is a goal, we're not providing medical treatments that may help a person live longer. Um, we're not gonna be providing treatments like CPR or breathing machines or tube feeding. We're often not providing treatments like IV therapy or IV antibiotics. Okay, so the goal is just to make someone more comfortable, reduce their symptoms, and improve their quality of life and their quality of dying. This does not mean care is stopped, and that's what we run into very often, is people feel that if they have a comfort-only approach to care, that care is stopped. Care is very active, but the focus of the care is quite different. Living longer as a goal. So we've talked a bit about this, but really it means providing treatment with the goal of prolonging life really at, with any means. This often means going to hospital, and it may mean being um, uh, subjected to more invasive treatments like those found in an ICU, like CPR, like breathing, a breathing tube or tube feeding. Unfortunately, these treatments often cause pain and more suffering and rarely lead to a longer life, especially with very advanced disease. 
Warren mentioned this before, but this is often the default when someone doesn't have clearly identified goals of care or hasn't had these conversations with their family members before they're faced with um, uh, a serious illness. And the last one is something in between as a goal. So a person may want certain kinds of care if it could help them return to their previous level of function. So this may include being hospitalized for treatments like antibiotics in the case of an infection or having those treatments delivered at home or in a long-term care facility. This often does not include aggressive treatments like CPR or breathing tubes and often doesn't include things like tube feeding. Most people will choose comfort or something in between as a goal, especially those people who have um, had these conversations with their loved ones or their health providers before. Just before you go to the case, for the clinicians in the room, um, we use uh, two tools. One is the Serious Illness Conversation Guide, and one is a program called Vital Talk to teach uh, communication skills uh, for those living with serious illness. And the bottom line is, um, what we typically see with people who aren't using a program like this is that people talk about decision making and they start at a point of the decision. So we need to know about a feeding tube. We need to know about if you want to go to the hospital. We need to know about IV antibiotics. And what we do is something quite different and we feel that we have medical knowledge, we have experience, and our patients and families need us to make a recommendation based on our experience. So if you flip it on its head and you ask all about what matters most to this person, what they're hoping for, what they're worried about, that's when you can make a strong recommendation whether or not it makes sense for them to go to the hospital. So you can say, you know, Mrs. Smith, I understand the most important thing is um, independence and for your loved one to be able to do ABC. Given the infection, I'm not sure the treatment is going to be able to help your loved one achieve all those things that they're wanting. I don't think going to the hospital is going to help them do A, B, and C, and so I'm recommending we do the following and see, have the conversation start from there. So let's use a case. Mrs. M is, so we're gonna talk about a case and then think about that approach, the three steps in coming to a decision because um, there will be a question of what do we do? Mrs. M is 89, she lives in long-term care. She's had dementia for six years. Her current state of function is that she spends, she's bed bound all her time in bed. She needs help with all of her personal care and she's minimally verbal, so minimally communicative. She eats minimal pureed food. Feeding takes a very long time and there's often coughing. The nurses have been concerned that food is going the wrong way. So you're the spouse and you get a call at 11 p.m. at night, of course. That's when bad things happen, when the regular staff is not there during the day. And Mrs. M is coughing and she has a fever. Her breathing is comfortable after starting supplemental oxygen. Oops, sorry. So the question comes to you as the spouse. What would you like us to do? This is not an uncommon scenario, unfortunately. So let's use our approach to decision making. First, we're going to clarify the clinical situation. We're gonna ask ourselves, are there advanced care plans? What's important to her? What does she value? What makes life worth living? What are the things that if she could no longer do wouldn't make uh, that quality of life acceptable to that person? Are there previously expressed wishes? Lastly, with all that in mind, we're gonna align the treatment with, um, with what her goals would be knowing her values. So here, let's clarify the scenario. We think she may have pneumonia. She's coughing, she has a fever. And we think that um, this likely happened because either water, saliva, or food went into the respiratory tract rather than go uh, into the digestive tract. This is a common complication of the end stage of dementia. Mrs. M swallowing is impaired because of her advanced dementia. So this is not going to get better. The dietician has been involved, the personal support worker is helping to feed, they've even tried a medicine to try to stimulate her appetite so she would eat more. None of this has helped, unfortunately. Her swallowing cannot be fixed, and the problems are anticipated to continue and to get worse over time. So what are we doing? What are the goals of care here? 
Is it to live longer? And if so, this is what that could look like. Transferring to hospital, starting IV antibiotics, probably IV fluids as well, blood work, chest x-ray, plus or minus other tests. It may mean an escalation to more aggressive care in the intensive care unit. And it may include a conversation about, well, if she can't eat safely, do we, put an, do we start artificial feeding? Do we put in a tube? And temporarily before we do that, what typically happens is a nasogastric tube goes in, so up through the nose, down the back of the throat, and feeds get started that way first. That's a temporary measure. Now, what if the goals are comfort focused? What might that look like? So that might mean staying in her home, and for her, home is long-term care. Maybe she's lived there for a few years. Uh, the staff know her well. She has uh, friends at the nursing home. Medications could be started to st help with the breathlessness, not necessarily to fix the problem, but to alleviate some of that feeling of shortness of breath. Oxygen has already been started. That can be continued. There may be other medicines that could be introduced if she's having other symptoms ongoing mouth care, and if she's awake and alert and indicating interest in food, careful hand feeding for comfort, acknowledging the ongoing risk, which is not going away in any of the three scenarios that we might talk about. Middle of the road, so we've talked about living longer, comfort focused on sort of extremes. What might a hybrid of this look like? So that might mean at first staying in long-term care, and starting antibiotics that are pills by mouth rather than IV, which is not available at the nursing home. This, we call, would call this a trial and talking about the expectation, we can try this. It may work, it may not work. Continue careful hand feeding for, for comfort. So aligning the treatment with her goals. Unfortunately, Mrs. M did not leave us any advanced directives. But she did express wishes to not prolong life when she was dependent, in a dependent state, meaning she has lost her independence to get up and go to the bathroom, to walk on her own, to feed herself, to bathe herself. So with the value of uh, independence and communicating with loved ones, also known to be important to her, and these things, unfortunately, are gone. So in light of that, the decision was made in this scenario to keep Mrs. M in her long-term care home and to focus on exclusively providing comfort. Is that surprising? A, a surprising sort of uh, possibility for anyone in the room? And we're not here to say, please always choose comfort. It, that's not the intention here, but it's to go through the example of the three options and to see what fits best for that individual based on what we know about them. And it can be so hard, as we saw in that video as well, so hard as a family member, as a loved one, to be sort of thrust into the, uh, what feels like the hot seat of decision making. What do I do? I'm not really sure. And what can also be really difficult is to separate what do I want because I don't want my mom to die and I'm not ready to say goodbye versus what would she be telling us to do if she had the ability to tell us, looking on this scenario, what would she be telling the doctors to do? And so it can be really hard to separate. And I think from the healthcare provider point of view, um, it's easier for us to sometimes recognize that that may be a difficulty because we're outside of it. You know, I, I, I may have an easier time um, providing suggestions, Karen, because it's not my loved one. It's totally different if it's your loved one. So um, encouraging the decision maker to say, you know, what would be important to your mom? Your mom's, what, what would she tell us if she, in her own voice, could tell us right now what she feels? Is this an acceptable quality of life to her? Is this meaningful? Should we be um, trying to prolong this stage of her life? What would she be telling us to do? Okay, thanks Nadine. The last part, just a few more minutes, is really just to share what we have at, um, at the Western and UHN. So at Toronto Western Hospital, we're a team of five doctors, one clinical nurse um, specialist and one administrator. Uh, what we need on our team is a social worker and a psychologist or counselor, among other supports. But we're working with a physician and nurse right now for our clinical team. And we, see, we do three main uh, things. One is clinical care. 
And the bulk of our work is in the inpatient setting. So people will call us when a patient is admitted to the hospital and we see folks who have symptom needs or needs with planning um, and goals of care discussions when they're sick admitted to the hospital. Uh, I have clinic here with an asterisk. So our goal is to beef up clinics here. Right now, if your loved one has, or your patients are, uh, have their family doctor in the, the family health team at Toronto Western Hospital, the family doctors or the family doctor team can refer to us and we can see patients who are seen by their family doctor in clinic here in the clinic. Um, and finally, we all attend or do weekend coverage at the hospice, Kensington Hospice, which is nearby. Our hope is to have over time a new clinic model where we can come in and see more patients in clinic wherever they are, whichever clinic they're at at the hospital, but because of staffing needs, we're not there yet. And we have on occasion gone into the movement disorders clinic or the memory uh, clinic to see folks with dementia. And we are happy to do that, especially now that we have a doc who is uh, very interested in expanding our palliative care program. The second piece that we do is education. So we train future doctors to know primary palliative care skills, and we also train specialists to become palliative care specialists at the medical student level, the resident and fellowship level. Uh, and we're expanding those programs as well. And we also offer interdisciplinary workshops for uh, non-specialists. And finally, we do research and quality improvement to try to um, look at m new models of care, to try and address gaps. So to speak to your point earlier, I have a, it's gonna take over a year to do, but we're at the beginning steps of developing a survey um, for recently graduated family doctors. Um, so the cohort graduating in 2020 will get two weeks before they graduate a 14 page questionnaire identifying kind of what the local landscape looks like at U of T across all 14 hospital training sites, how much palliative care family doctors got exposed to, what settings, was it in long-term care homes, inpatient, outpatient. Um, so we're gonna get a baseline scope of what we're currently doing at the university. Um, we're gonna look at goals of care discussions because these are difficult discussions to have. How many were observed? How many people got direct feedback? What proportion of their family doctors or their nurses that they worked with did they observe doing a conversation and would they rate those as high quality or poor quality and why? So this falls under the research. So we know that there are large gaps in our province with respect to end of life and palliative care. And so we're working towards looking at what the gaps are and helping the province uh, fix those. So the four main buckets here for the visual learners, we have at UHN inpatient ability uh, to have palliative care consults across all three sites, um, Princess Margaret Hospital, um, Toronto General and Toronto Western Hospital. Um, we don't follow patients at home, but we can refer depending on someone's catchment area to community teams um, and give recommendation for the nurses and doctors to care for folks at end of life with dementia. Uh, we have the ability in certain clinics to come and see folks with dementia here, and we can transfer patients into our hospice for end of life care. Um, so that is our talk. The last slide really is the definition of primary versus specialty level palliative care. So we are not saying that every individual with dementia needs to have a, a specialist palliative care doctor see them. Um, but we are here if needed. Um, the province just came out with new guidelines on clinical competencies for non-palliative care specialists. So what does a dietitian in orthopedics need to know about palliative care? What does a nurse or social worker or physician in caring for someone with dementia need to know about palliative care? So if you go to OPCN's website, the Ontario Palliative Care Network, they have drafted a list of competencies that all clinicians should have based on discipline and um, uh, specialty for what what is needed to help care for this population. Um, my thinking is that we don't have the tools to, to make this, to, to have everyone be clinically competent, but we're at the beginning of at least establishing what those needs are. Um, and our team is always eager to speak and to help educate people so that uh, we can improve the care. And the other thing I wanted to say about home is Home is where a person is, so whether it's in their home setting, their long-term care home, or um, the hospital or palliative care unit or hospice, that is where a home is. And we uh, can, I believe within every setting within this province, there is at least primary palliative care, and uh, if not specialist palliative care. And we're always happy you can email us um, if you have a question about navigating resources and we can get our nurse involved to help out. 
So that's the talk, and we're happy to take any questions. Good. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. I really learned a lot about it. Um, my questions have to do, are twofold. Uh, I'm caring for my mom who has dementia and Alzheimer's and she's at home. She is a patient at St. Mike's and at Baycrest. And I'm wondering how I can access palliative care for her. Uh, my second related question is she kind of falls in between middle and late stage and is that important when trying to access palliative care? Um, we can all try. Um, so St. Michael's, um, I mean, I, I haven't been there since I was a clerk uh, in medical school, but they have a palliative care team at St. Michael's Hospital. I'm not sure if they do, um, if they have, uh, do clinic visits like we do here. Um, Baycrest also has a palliative care uh, team. And sort of the third option is that there um, are palliative home visiting teams that cover certain catchment areas in, in the city. Um, the challenge, which is really a gap in our system, is that oftentimes because prognosis is so challenging in this population, um, uh, these services are not well enough equipped to be able to sort of do home visits for many, many years for someone who may um, show some stability over, you know, several years. Um, so, uh, so that like is my initial thought in th those three. Um, the other thing is, you know, what we've shared is that really all of your mother's practitioners, um, family doctor, specialist doctors, uh, the hope is that they have some knowledge in palliative care and can at least start having some of these important conversations, especially around advanced care planning and goal setting um, early on. And uh, you had mentioned is the fact that she's sort of in between the moderate and advanced stages, does that matter? Um, it matters in that, you know, it sounds like she's making a transition between stages, so that's an opportunity to, uh, to bring up some of these important questions. Yeah, and just to add, I find that social workers and nurses are very helpful people in the clinic setting, and it may, that's how we, I think, get some of our consults, um, because the, your, whole te your mom's whole team is looking at your mom. Um, and so what I would say is speak with the team um, and uh, start from there and ask about what resources are available or their thoughts on getting your mom uh, care for home. I think the other thing I would recommend is printing off the Speak Up campaign booklet and going through it um, and then just bringing that to the next appointment um, and, and dedicating a clinic visit. This is not something that we usually recommend adding on to a busy clinic visit, but saying, I really want to talk about future care planning and bring that and make an appointment for that and then bring the book and you have 45 minutes or half an hour to, to go through some of the um, questions that would pop up as you go through that. Yeah. Can I just add, um, in giving this talk today, I mean, there are many, it sounds like you're a great advocate for your mom and we meet many advocates and I hope we haven't, um, given the impression that you're not doing the best and the most for your loved one unless you have a palliative care specialist. Not every scenario will need input of one of the physicians like us. It's really about identifying what are the needs and are they being met. Um, so it doesn't mean that if you don't have a specific palliative care specialist involved with your mom's care, it doesn't mean that you haven't met her needs or others and I think that might be part of the impression too. Well, I heard about palliative care, it's amazing. It doesn't always look the same way. It's really about are your mom's needs being met or your spouse or whoever you're, you're involved with and caring for um, and accessing starting with the community resources. And I mean, one of the huge gaps in our system is we seem to do a good job at um, being present, uh, at least in clinic settings, for the, our cancer population. So early palliative care referral. Um, there are places where people can go when they're still ambulatory and still receiving other treatment. And there just are less resources right now for the non-cancer group in terms of being able to sort of uh, see a, a specialist palliative care provider in the community, even if it's infrequent. Um, those clinics, at least right now, just don't really exist. Um, so, you know, we depend on people like us sort of going in and visiting other people's clinics, clinics right now. Uh, years ago, there used to be a supportive care clinic out of St. Joseph's Hospital that used to manage some of these non-cancer cases and that unfortunately is not there anymore. I have a question. 
So I may not be quite elegant in asking this, but uh, you know, I know now we have a choice. You know, if we get really sick, we can decide to end our lives. Um, what are the options then for our loved one? Like, is there is there any option as a caregiver if I see that the loved one is, you know, would have ended his life if he had the choice? Do you know if there's an option or it's just out of the question? It's an excellent question. And the answer to this question may change over time, but currently the answer, the short answer is no. In order to access medical assistance in dying, it is the individual themselves who needs to be able to consent to it. Um, so if we're talking about the dementia group, if you're at the end stages of dementia, by definition of end state of dementia, you have significant impairment in your thinking and your decision making, and you wouldn't be able to consent to medical assistance in dying. Will so that change? How do you decide if, you, if, like, if the loved one um, can make the decision? They, they assess it? Or? Yes, yeah, so the question, the question was how, how do we know whether an individual still has the capacity to uh, make decisions? So that's something that can be assessed by a healthcare provider. Uh, but it's tricky uh, because if you are well enough to make decisions, you're probably not in the advanced stage of dementia. Yeah. Not probably, I, that's more certain terms. You're not advanced dementia if you can still make your decisions. So um, effectively it excludes that group right now. Over time that answer may change, but right now, no. We also, we pulled up the e-poll, perhaps for the folks who are streaming as well, in case there are some questions, you can send them through. I have a question. In my situation, oh, I'm going to go to my For anyone that's leaving, if you could make sure to fill out your evaluations, it'll help us. This is the first time we give this talk, and we'll want to make it um, the same or better. That'd be helpful. Um, my question surrounds my husband. He's presently in a transitional bed, um, so he's waiting for long-term care placement, and um, we've been given two to five years for that placement. So if I wanted to do advanced care planning, who would you suggest I should approach? Should I approach the folks where he is now? Okay. So the team there, right? Was there, when you were, when your husband was admitted to the transitional care, was there like an intake process where they asked you about, um, you know, wishes around things like CPR or hospitalization or his values? Gosh. <laughs> Sorry, so much has happened. I think probably when he was first admitted to Baycrest, uh, mm. so that I would assume would have all gone to where he is now, he's been there seven months yeah. at the transitional bed. So you can for sure request um, another one of those meetings with, um, oftentimes it's sort of a nursing lead that will come and speak with you and if there's a change to uh, his care plan that, that, can, that should be able to be done there. That's also done upon admission to long-term care and anytime there's a change in status. So if someone gets hospitalized and goes back to the long-term care facility, um, those meetings are supposed to be happening uh, to address any changes in, in, your, in his philosophy or your philosophy of care. Yeah. Very good, thank um, you. But, but so as you can see, uh, it, it, it often takes someone actually making that request. So yes. um, they may be uh, taken aback when you make that request, but they should be able to bring either a nurse or a social worker uh, to come help address that. Yep. Yeah. Will do, thank you. If, if there aren't other questions, we're happy to hang around for a few minutes if people wanna talk to us um, in a different setting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming today. Cool. <coughs> Just very quickly, I just wanted to say thank you to our wonderful speakers for a great and informative talk. And thank you for all of you uh, coming today as well. And stay tuned, we'll have other sessions um, on different topics uh, related to dementia care. Thank you.